Hi folks, welcome to Some of Each. Some of Each in which I read to you each week from some fiction, some poetry, and some children's lit on a specific theme. And tonight's theme for episode four is prehistoric. So um, I'm going to start off for you with some fiction. Um, I'm reading to you tonight from a short story from Ray Bradbury's um, Golden Apples of the Sun, which was published in 1952, but I think you'll be surprised at how some of the, um, some of the phrases in this story are rather prophetic. So, um, so Ray Bradbury, 1952, and the story is called A Sound of Thunder. The sign on the wall seemed to quaver under a film of sliding warm water. Eccles felt his eyelids blink over his stare, and the sign burned in this momentary darkness. Time Safari, Inc. Safaris to any year in the past. You name the animal, we take you there, you shoot it. Warm phlegm gathered in Eccles' throat. He swallowed and pushed it down. The muscles around his mouth formed a smile as he put his hand slowly out upon the air, and in that hand waved a check for $10,000 to the man behind the desk. Does this safari guarantee I come back alive? We guarantee nothing, said the official, except the dinosaurs. He turned. This is Mr. Travis, your safari guide in the past. He'll tell you what and where to shoot. If he says no shooting, no shooting. If you disobey instructions, there's a stiff penalty of another $10,000, plus possible government action on your return. <clears throat> Eccles glanced across the vast office at a mass and tangle, a snaking and humming of wires and steel boxes, at an aurora that flickered, now orange, now silver, now blue. There was a giant sound, sound like a gigantic bonfire burning all of time, all the years and all the parchment calendars, all the hours piled high and set aflame. A touch of the hand in this burning wood in the instant beautifully reversed itself. Eccles remembered the wording in the advertisements to the letter. Out of chars and ashes, out of dust and coals, like golden salamanders, the old years, the green years, might leap. Roses sweet in the air, white hair turn Irish black, wrinkles vanish, all, everything fly back to seed, flee death, rush down to their beginnings. Suns rise in western skies and set in glorious easts. Moons eat themselves opposite to the custom, all and everything cupping one another like Chinese boxes, rabbits into hats, all and everything returning to the fresh death, the seed death, the green death, to the time before the beginning. A touch of a hand might do it, the merest touch of a hand. Unbelievable, Eccles breathed, the light of the machine on his thin face, a real time machine. He shook his head. Makes you think. If the election had gone badly yesterday, I might be here now running away from the results. Thank God Keith won. He'll make a fine president of the United States. Yes, said the man behind the desk. We're lucky. If Deutscher had gotten in, we'd have the worst kind of dictatorship. There's an anti-everything man for you, a militarist, anti-Christ, anti-human, anti-intellectual. People called us up, you know, joking, but not joking, said if Deutscher became president, they wanted to go live in 1492. Of course, it's not our business to conduct escapes, but to form safaris. Anyway, Keith's president now. All you got to worry about is shooting my dinosaur, Eccles finished it for him. Tyrannosaurus Rex, the tyrant lizard, the most incredible monster in history. Sign this release. Anything happens to you, we're not responsible. Those dinosaurs are hungry. Eccles flushed angrily. Trying to scare me? Frankly, yes. We don't want anyone going who will panic at the first shot. Six safari leaders were killed last year and a dozen hunters. We're here to give you the severest thrill a real hunter ever asked for. Traveling you back 60 million years to bag the biggest game in all of time. Your personal check's still there. Tear it up. Mr. Eccles looked at the check. His fingers twitched. Good luck, said the man behind the desk. Mr. Travis, he's all yours. They moved silently across the room, taking their guns with them toward the machine, toward the silver metal and the roaring light. First a day and then a night and then a day and then a night. Then it was day, night, day, night, a week, a month, a year, a decade. 
AD 2055, AD 2019, 1999, 1957, gone. The machine roared. They put on their oxygen helmets and tested the intercoms. Eccles swayed on the padded seat, his face pale, his jaw stiff. He felt the trembling in his arms and he looked down and found his hands tight on the new rifle. There were four other men in the machine. Travis, the safari leader, his assistant, L'Esperance, and two other hunters, Billings and Kramer. They sat looking at each other, and the years blazed around them. Can these guns get a dinosaur cold? Eccles felt his mouth saying. If you hit them right, said Travis into the helmet radio, some dinosaurs have two brains, one in the head, another far down the spinal column. We stay away from those. That's stretching luck. Put your first two shots into the eyes if you can, blind them, and then go back into the brain. The machine howled. Time was a film run backward. Suns fled and 10 million moons fled after them. Think, said Eccles, every hunter that ever lived would envy us today. This makes Africa seem like Illinois. The machine slowed. Its scream fell to a murmur. The machine stopped. The sun stopped in the sky. The fog that had enveloped the machine blew away, and they were in an old time, a very old time indeed, three hunters and two safari heads with their blue metal guns across their knees. Christ isn't born yet, said Travis. Moses has not gone to the mountains to talk with God. The pyramids are still in the earth, waiting to be cut out and put up. Remember that. Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler, none of them exists, the man nodded. That, Mr. Travis pointed, is the jungle of 60,000,000 years before President Keith. He indicated a metal path that struck off into green wilderness over steaming swamp among giant ferns and palms. And that, he said, is the path laid by Time Safari for your use. It floats six inches above the earth, doesn't touch so much as one grass blade, flower, or tree. It's an anti-gravity metal its purpose is to keep you from touching this world of the past in any way. Stay on the path. Don't go off it. I repeat, don't go off for any reason. If you fall off, there's a penalty. And don't shoot any animal we don't okay. Why? asked Eccles. They sat in the ancient wilderness. Far birds' cries blew on a wind, and the smell of tar and an old salt sea, moist grasses, and flowers the color of blood. We don't want to change the future. We don't belong here in the past. The government doesn't like us here. We have to pay big graft to keep our franchise. A time machine is finicky business. Not knowing it, we might kill an important animal, a small bird, a roach, a flower even, thus destroying an important link in a growing species. That's not clear, said Eccles. All right, Travis continued, say we accidentally kill one mouse here. That means all the future families of this one particular mouse are destroyed, right? Right. And all the families of all the families of all the families of that one mouse. With a stamp of your foot, you annihilate first one, then a dozen, then a thousand, a million, a billion possible mice. So they're dead, said Eccles. So what? So what? Travis snorted quietly. Well, what about the foxes they'll need those mice to survive? For want of ten mice, a fox dies. For want of ten foxes, a lion starves. For want of a lion, all manner of insects, vultures, infinite billions of life forms are thrown into chaos and destruction. Eventually, it all boils down to this. Fifty-nine million years later, a caveman, one of a dozen of the entire world, goes hunting wild boar or saber-toothed tiger for food. But you, friend, have stepped on all the tigers in that region by stepping on one single mouse. So the caveman starves, and the caveman, please note, is not just any expendable man. No, he is an entire future nation. From his loins would have sprung ten sons, from their loins one hundred sons, and thus onward to a civilization. Destroy this one man, and you destroy a race, a people, an entire history of life. It is comparable to slaying some of Adam's grandchildren. The stomp of your foot on one mouse could start an earthquake the effects of which could shake our earth and destinies down through time to their very foundations. With the death of that one caveman, a billion others yet unborn are throttled in the womb. Perhaps Rome never rises on its seven hills. Perhaps Europe is forever a dark forest, and only Asia waxes healthy and teeming. 
Step on a mouse and you crush the pyramids. Step on a mouse and you leave your print like a Grand Canyon across eternity. Queen Elizabeth might never be born. Washington might not cross the Delaware. There might never be a United States at all. So be careful, stay on the path. Never step off. I see, said Eccles. Then it wouldn't pay for us even to touch the grass? Correct. Crushing certain plants could add up infinitesimally. A little error here would multiply in 60 million years, all out of proportion. Of course, maybe our theory is wrong. Maybe time can't be changed by us. Or maybe it can be changed only in little subtle ways. A dead mouse here makes an insect imbalance there, a population disproportion later, a bad harvest further on, a depression, mass starvation, and finally, a change in social temperament in far-flung countries. Something much more subtle, like that. Perhaps only a soft breath, a whisper, a hair, pollen on the air. Such a slight, slight change that unless you looked close, you wouldn't see it. Who knows? Who really can say he knows? We don't know. We're guessing. But until we do know for certain whether our messing around in time can make a big roar or a little rustle in history, we're being careful. This machine, this path, your clothing and bodies were sterilized, as you know, before the journey. We wear these oxygen helmets so we can't introduce our bacteria into an ancient atmosphere. How do we know which animals to shoot? They're marked with red paint, said Travis. Today, before our journey, we sent Lesperance here back here with the machine. He came to this particular era and followed certain animals, studying them. Right, said Lesperance. I track them through their entire existence, noting which of them lives longest. Very few. How many times they mate? Not often. Life short. When I find one that's going to die when a tree falls on him, or one that drowns in a tar pit, I note the exact hour, minute, and second. I shoot a paint bomb. It leaves a red patch on his side. We can't miss it. Then I correlate our arrival in the past so that we meet the monster not more than two minutes before he would have died anyway. This way, we kill only animals with no future that are never going to mate again. You see how careful we are? But if you came back this morning in time, said Eccles eagerly, you must have bumped into us, our safari. How did it turn out? Was it successful? Did all of us get through alive? Travis and Lesperance gave each other a look. That'd be a paradox, said the latter. Time doesn't permit that sort of mess a man meeting himself. When such occasions threaten, time steps aside. Like an airplane hitting an air pocket. You felt the machine jump just before we stopped? That was us, passing ourselves on the way back to the future. We saw nothing. There's no way of telling if this expedition was a success, if we got our monster, or whether all of us, meaning you, Mr. Eccles, got out alive. Eccles smiled palely. Cut that, said Travis sharply. Everyone on his feet. They were ready to leave the machine. The jungle was high and the jungle was broad and the jungle was the entire world forever and forever. Sounds like music and sounds like flying tents filled the sky and though there were pterodactyls soaring with cavernous gray wings, gigantic bats of delirium and night fever, Eccles, balanced on the narrow path, aimed his rifle playfully. Stop that, said Travis. Don't even aim for fun, blast you. If your gun should go off, Eccles flushed. Where's our Tyrannosaurus? Lesperance checked his wristwatch. Up ahead, we'll bisect his trail in 60 seconds. Look for the red paint. Don't shoot till we give the word. Stay on the path. Stay on the path. They moved forward in the wind of morning. Strange, murmured Eccles. Up ahead, 60 million years, election day is over. Keith made president, everyone celebrating, and here we are a million years lost and they don't exist. The things we worried about for months, a lifetime, not even born or thought of yet. Safety catches off, everyone, ordered Travis. You, you first shot, Eccles. Second, Billings. Third, Kramer. I've hunted tiger, wild boar, buffalo, elephant, but now this is it, said Eccles. I'm shaking like a kid. Ah, said Travis. Everyone stopped. Travis raised his hand. Ahead, he whispered. In the mist, there he is. There's his royal majesty now. The jungle was wide and full of twitterings, rustlings, murmurs, and sighs. Suddenly, it all ceased as if someone had shut a door. Silence, a sound of thunder. Out of the mist, 100 yards away, came Tyrannosaurus Rex. It, whispered Eccles, it, shh. It came on great oiled, resilient, striding legs. It towered 30 feet above half the trees, a great evil god, 
folding its delicate watchmaker's claws close to its oily reptilian chest. Each lower leg was a piston, a thousand pounds of white bone sunk in thick ropes of muscle, sheathed over in a gleam of pebbled skin like the mail of a terrible warrior. Each thigh was a ton of neat ivory and steel mesh. And from the great breathing cage of the upper body, those two delicate arms dangled out front, arms with hands which might pick up and examine men like toys, while the snake neck coiled. And the head itself, a ton of sculptured stone, lifted easily upon the sky. Its mouth gaped, exposing a fence of teeth like daggers. Its eyes rolled, ostrich eggs, empty of all expression save hunger. It closed its mouth in a death grin. It ran, its pelvic bones crushing aside trees and bushes, its taloned feet clawing damp earth, leaving prints six inches deep wherever it settled its weight. It ran with a gliding ballet step, far too poised and balanced for its 10 tons. It moved into a sunlit area warily, its beautiful reptilian hands feeling the air. Why, why, Eccles twitched his mouth, it could reach up and grab the moon. Shh, Travis jerked angrily. He hasn't seen us yet. It can't be killed, Eccles pronounced this verdict quietly, as if there could be no argument. He had weighed the evidence, and this was his considered opinion. The rifle in his hands seemed a cap gun. We were fools to come. This is impossible. Shut up, hissed Travis. Nightmare. Turn around, commanded Travis. Walk quietly to the machine. We'll remit half your fee. I didn't realize it would be this big, said Eccles. I miscalculated, that's all, and now I want out. It sees us. There's the red paint on its chest. The tyrant lizard raised itself. Its armored flesh glittered like a thousand green coins. The coins, crusted with slime, steamed. In the slime, tiny insects wriggled so that the entire body seemed to twitch and undulate, even while the monster itself did not move. It exhaled. The stink of raw flesh blew down the wilderness. Get me out of here, said Eccles. It was never like this before. It was always sure I'd come through alive. I had good guides, good safaris, and safety. This time, I figured wrong. I've met my match, and I admit it. This is too much for me to get hold of. Don't run, said Lesperance. Turn around. Hide in the machine. Yes, Eccles seemed to be numb. He looked at his feet as if trying to make them move. He gave a grunt of helplessness. Eccles! He took a few steps, blinking, shuffling. Not that way! The monster, at the first motion, lunged forward with a terrible scream. It covered 100 yards in six seconds. The rifles jerked up and blazed fire. A windstorm from the beast's mouth engulfed them in the stench of slime and old blood. The monster roared, teeth glittering with sun. The rifles cracked again. Their sound was lost in shriek and lizard thunder. The great level of the reptile's tail swung up, lashed sideways. Trees exploded in clouds of leaf and branch. The monster twisted its jeweler's hands down to fondle at the men, to twist them in half, to crush them like berries, to cram them into its teeth and its screaming throat. Its boulder stone eyes leveled with the men. They saw themselves mirrored. They fired at the metallic eyelids and the blazing black iris. Like a stone idol, like a mountain avalanche, Tyrannosaurus fell. Thundering, it clutched trees, pulled them with it. It wrenched and tore the metal path. The men flung themselves back and away. The body hit, ten tons of cold flesh and stone. The guns fired. The monster lashed its armored tail, twitched its snake jaws, and lay still. A fount of blood spurted from its throat. Somewhere inside, a sack of fluids burst. Sickening gushes drenched the hunters. They stood red and glistening. The thunder faded. The jungle was silent. After the avalanche, a green peace. After the nightmare, morning. Billings and Kramer sat on the pathway and threw up. Travis and Lesperance stood with smoking rifles, cursing steadily. In the time machine, on his face, Eccles lay shivering. He had found his way back to the path, climbed into the machine. 
Travis came walking, glanced at Eccles, took cotton gauze from a metal box and returned to the others who were sitting on the path. Clean up. They wiped the blood from their helmets. They began to curse too. The monster lay a hill of solid flesh. Within, you could hear the sighs and murmurs as the furthest chambers of it died. The organs malfunctioning, liquids running a final instant from pocket to sack to spleen, everything shutting off, closing up forever. It was like standing by a wrecked locomotive or a steam shovel at quitting time, all valves being released or levered tight. Bones cracked. The tonnage of its own flesh, off balance, dead weight, snapped the delicate forearms, caught underneath. The meat settled, quivering. Another cracking sound. Overhead, a gigantic tree branch broke from its heavy mooring, fell. It crashed upon the dead beast with finality. There, Lesperance checked his watch, right on time. That's the giant tree that was scheduled to fall and kill this animal originally. He glanced at the two hunters. You want the trophy picture? What? We can't take a trophy back to the future. The body has to stay right here, where it would have died originally, so the insects, birds, and bacteria can get at it, as they were intended to. Everything in balance. The body stays, but we can take a picture of you standing near it. The two men tried to think, but gave up, shaking their heads. They let themselves be led along the metal path. They sank wearily into the machine cushions. They gazed back at the ruined monster, the stagnating mound, where already strange reptilian birds and golden insects were busy at the steaming armor. A sound on the floor of the time machine stiffened them. Eccles sat there, shivering. I'm sorry, he said at last. Get up, cried Travis. Eccles got up. Go out on that path alone, said Travis. He had his rifle pointed. You're not coming back in the machine. We're leaving you here. Lesperance seized Travis's arm. Wait, stay out of this. Travis shook his hand away. This fool nearly killed us. But it isn't that so much. No, it's his shoes. Look at them. He ran off the path. That ruins us. We'll forfeit thousands of dollars of insurance. We guarantee no one leaves the path. He left it. Oh, the fool. I'll have to report to the government. They might revoke our license to travel. Who knows what he's done to time, to history. Take it easy. All I did was kick up some dirt. How do we know, cried Travis. We don't know anything. It's all a mystery. Get out of here, Eccles. Eccles fumbled his shirt. I'll pay anything, a hundred thousand dollars. Travis glared at Eccles' checkbook and spat. Get out there, the monster next to the path. Stick your arms up to your elbows in his mouth. Then you can come back with us. That's unreasonable. The monster's dead, you idiot. The bullets, the bullets can't be left behind. They don't belong in the past. They might change anything. Here's my knife, dig them out. The jungle was alive again, full of the old tremorings and bird cries. Eccles turned slowly to regard the primeval garbage dump, that hill of nightmares and terror. After a long time, like a sleepwalker, he shuffled out along the path. He returned, shuddering, five minutes later, his arms soaked and red to the elbows. He held out his hands. Each held a number of steel bullets. Then he fell. He lay where he fell, not moving. You didn't have to make him do that, said Lesperance. Didn't I? It's too early to tell. Travis nudged the still body. He'll live. Next time he won't go hunting game like this. Okay? He jerked his thumb wearily at Les Bronx. Switch on. Let's go home. 1492. 1776. 1812. They cleaned their hands and faces. They changed their caking shirts and pants. Eccles was up and around again, not speaking. Travis glared at him for a full ten minutes. Don't look at me, cried Eccles. I haven't done anything. Who can tell? Just ran off the path, that's all. A little mud on my shoes. What do you want me to do, get down and pray? We might need it. I'm warning you, Eccles. I might kill you yet. I've got my gun ready. I'm innocent. I've done nothing. 1999, 2000, 2055. The machine stopped. Get out, said Travis. The room was there as they had left it, but not the same as they had left it. The same man sat behind the same desk, but the same man did not quite sit behind the same desk. Travis looked around swiftly. Everything okay here? He snapped. Fine. Welcome home. Travis did not relax. He seemed to be looking through the one high window. Okay, Eccles, get out. Don't ever come back. Eccles could not move. You heard me, said Travis. What are you staring at? Eccles stood smelling of the air, and there was a thing to the air, a chemical taint so subtle, so slight, that only a faint cry of his subliminal senses warned him it was there. The colors, white, gray, blue, orange, in the wall, in the furniture, in the sky beyond the window were, were, and there was a feel 
His flesh twitched, his hands twitched. He stood drinking the oddness with the pores of his body. Somewhere, someone must have been screaming one of those whistles that only a dog can hear. His body screamed silence in return. Beyond this room, beyond this wall, beyond this man who was not quite the same man seated at this desk that was not quite the same desk, lay an entire world of streets and people. What sort of world it was now, there was no telling. He could feel them moving there, beyond the walls almost, like so many chess pieces blown in a dry wind. But the immediate thing was a sign painted on the office wall, the same sign he had read earlier today on the first entering. Somehow the sign had changed. I don't know if you all can see that. Time Safari Inc. Safaris to any year in the past. You name the animal. We take you thar. You shoot it. Eccles felt himself fall into a chair. He fumbled crazily at the thick slime on his boots. He held up a clod of dirt, trembling. No, it can't be. Not a little thing like that. No. Embedded in the mud, glistening green and gold and black, was a butterfly. Very beautiful and very dead. Not a little thing like that, not a butterfly, cried Eccles. It fell to the floor, an exquisite thing, a small thing that could upset balances and knock down a line of small dominoes and then big dominoes and then gigantic dominoes all down the years across time. Eccles' mind whirled. It couldn't change things. Killing one butterfly couldn't be that important, could it? His face was cold. His mouth trembled, asking, who, who won the presidential election yesterday? The man behind the desk laughed. You joking? You know very well. Deutscher, of course. Who else? Not that fool weakling Keith. We got an Iron Man now, a man with guts. The official stopped. What's wrong? Eccles moaned. He dropped to his knees. He scrabbled at the golden butterfly with shaking fingers. Can't we? He pleaded to the world, to himself, to the officials, to the machine. Can't we take it back? Can't we make it alive again? Can't we start over? Can't we... He did not move. Eyes shut, he waited, shivering. He heard Travis breathe loud in the room. He heard Travis shift his rifle, click the safety catch, and raise the weapon. There was a sound of thunder. So that is A Sound of Thunder by Ray Bradbury from The Golden Apples of the Sun, 1952. Very relevant still, I would say. And that one was for my dad, who um, was, an, was an English teacher and taught uh, science fiction to high school students. And he was the one who originally introduced me to Ray Bradbury. So hi, Dad, if you're watching. So um, we're going to move on to the poetry portion. So I'm going to start with um, a poem from a friend of mine, Brian Simino. Um, this isn't in a book yet, but it was featured um, in Poetry Daily a little while back. And it's called The Fossil Record by Brian Simino. Until now, I was never one of those kids obsessed with dinosaurs. Scientists say we find, with luck, maybe 40% of a specimen's bones and reconstruct the rest. A century of digging, entire careers of imagining limbs and skin, diet and teeth, has recreated bone by resurrected bone, an unknown species, a fearsome aquatic hunter bigger than T-Rex, I say, let us all be one of those kids in paleo print jammies who memorize a million made up names. Take Saturdays to gaze at skeletons strung together. Study forest floors for tracks preserved by ancient mud turned stone. Every bird on its perch discloses ways the dinosaurs never left at all. Bits of life even extinction couldn't kill. The news offers daily apocalypse daily strife. So nightly, watch the sky and remember how much rubble there is to fall from space, its height never faded to hold. Missiles swivel to face our homes and glaciers loose a new flood's weight. Against such days, may we all become dinosaurs. Let us love the stories our bones will tell. I love that poem. <laughs> um, and next I'm going to read uh, uh, three poems to you from this chat book called The Last Mastodon. Um, the poet is Christina Olson, um, and she uh, wrote this chat book inspired by um, 
some time that she spent um, uh, in residence um, at the Western Science Center in uh, Hemet, California. I guess she was uh, at the museum there among the paleontologists um, and wrote the poems in this book. So Christina Olson, I'm just gonna read you three of these. The first is called Catalog of Damages. All these years, not knowing the difference between mammoth and mastodon, just another human so proud of her indifference. It's in the teeth. Mammoth teeth resemble the rubber sole of a snow boot. Mastodon teeth, jagged mountains turned to granite after all these years. Jefferson thought the West still crawled with mastodons, sent Lewis and Clark to thin the herd. All morning, I've tried to reconcile our ambition with the misery it brings. What we set out to do and what disaster ensues. 11 foot at the shoulder, Max is the largest mastodon in the West. Jefferson owned Sally Hemings. I never could make small talk with my father. I told you this was a catalog of damages. Oh God, the mouth is such a weapon. Right. And this one is called Self-Portrait with Mastodon Remains. The skull has been punched once, twice. 11,000 years later, the paleontologist fits another tusk into the holes and sees what damage the mouth can wreck once upon an epoch. One mastodon bleeds out and another one has a killer toothache. Mastodon, no one ever told you that a hairy coat hides all the blood or that the head weeps from any hole it sees fit to. When your bones are resettled in the flood, do not mourn the scattering of jaw from rib. And hasn't the heart begged free from the tongue? When they find what remains of your mouth, smile, finally reveal, despite the blue effort of glacier. Mastodon, the words beast plus tooth in Greek, that was my last kiss, my best kiss. All right, and one more from this collection. This one is called Broken Sonnet on Teeth. And then uh, it's got a little scientific name, Smilodo Pitalis. I told you about the mammoth tooth, flat and waffled like snow boots, and its cousin, the mastodon, its molars like breasts, that sin. But at La Brea, everyone wants to see the cat, Smilodon, eight inch knives in its mouth, that even now haunt our dreams. We are running, we are losing the race. Then behind us, a pant in the ear, single hot breath and we are down, flat. That's the end of that human story. We fear the knife of the saber tooth, its name a clear warning, but we miss its point. Smilodon died when its big prey died out, but we'll expire when the smallest life on earth does. Surely you've noticed the bees have gone quiet. Forget teeth, time to pray. So that's from the chapbook, The Last Mastodon by Christina Olson. It's a wonderful book. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna read you two of my own now for the poetry section. Um, this one's also about Smilodon. So this is a really recent poem I've written this week recent um, from the manuscript I'm working on right now about the Anthropocene and extinction. And it's going to have a, a set of these little poems within it called the Fossil Records, which are about um, more personal things from my childhood. But um, so I grew up uh, outside of Denver in Colorado and at the um, Denver Museum of Natural History, uh, where I used to go quite a bit as a kid in the lobby was um, the head of a Smilodon and it was like a donation station. You could put coins in it. So um, this poem was written for that. So fossil record, Smilodon. As a child, I put my hand between its teeth, dropped coins down its throat to make it roar. Pillared in the museum lobby, open jawed bust of a saber tooth cat, not a sphinx, but a Cerberus guarding the fossilized dead. Through rooms of wire-strung bones and taxidermied beasts, I was drawn to dioramas like a light-mired moth, 
pressing the buttons to hear their worlds described in tinny voices limbed with prehistoric lore as I held the bulky headphones tighter to my human ears. This felid, scalpel-mouthed and fierce, once stalked giant sloths, once was taken by the tar pits, bubbling cuspids, thick with tusks and fangs. Once snarling direwolves watched the stuck cat yowl. How I could hear the ghost growls echo through museum walls, each fossil body rigid with the sound. Small mammal that I was, pennies in my pocket as the exit loomed. All right, I'm going to read you one more. Um, also within this manuscript, there's a series of little poems I call the Anthropocene Blessings that are all written for um, various endangered species. Um, so this is one that goes way back to prehistoric times. So this is Anthropocene Blessing, California Condor. King of birds, you of the nine foot wingspan, you who glide for hours on currents of air without a single beat, thousands of feet above the leaden earth. Scavenger ancestor, only surviving member of your genus, longest lived. May you feast on the flesh of the dead as you toss their spirits up to the sky. May the carrion ghosts look down upon your unplumaged head, your black feathered sacred form, and be healed of all that stalked them in this world. May you not be poisoned by our buckshot, seething in each carcass we leave behind. May you outgrow our captivity to hatch your single eggs in mountain cliff caves, giant redwood trees. New world vulture, may your bulbous wrinkled visage remember how you soared over mammoths. May you be revered as virtuous, as rising back from the brink, as gathering your flock around the fallen. May you take death in your mouth and find it sweet. Find that it sustains. Right. So those are the poems for you tonight. I'm going to end on a lighter note um, with this book called Lulu and the Brontosaurus. This is by Judith Viorst. It's illustrated by Lane Smith, one of my faves. So buckle up. Lulu and the Brontosaurus. Now for something completely different. <laughs> Okay, all right, you don't have to tell me, I know. I know that people and dinosaurs have never lived on Earth at the same time. And I know that dinosaurs aren't living now. I even also know that paleontologists, folks who study dinosaurs, decided that a dinosaur was once called a brontosaurus, a very nice name, shouldn't be called a brontosaurus anymore, and changed it to a patasaurus, a kind of ugly name. But since I'm the person writing this story, I get to choose what I write. And I'm writing about a girl and a brontosaurus. So if you don't want to read this book, you can close it up right now. You won't hurt my feelings. And if you still want to read it, here goes. Chapter one. There was once a girl named Lulu, and she was a pain. She wasn't a pain in the elbow. She wasn't a pain in the knee. She was a pain, a very big pain, in the butt. Now, Lulu was an only child and her mom and dad gave her everything she wanted. And guess what? Lulu wanted everything. Tons of candy, tons of toys, tons of watching, tons of cartoons on TV. And if her mom and her dad ever said, and they hardly ever said it, sorry, darling, we think you've had enough. Lulu would screech till the light bulbs burst and throw herself down on the floor. And then she would kick her heels and wave her arms. And pretty soon her mom and dad would say, well, just this once and let her have whatever it was she wanted. Chapter two. Two weeks before Lulu's birthday, she announced to her mom and dad that she wanted a brontosaurus for her B-Day present. What did she say? What, a brontosaurus? Yes, she wanted a brontosaurus for a pet. At first, Lulu's mom and her dad just thought she was making a little joke. And then they saw, oh horrors, that she was serious. They patiently explained that a brontosaurus is quite enormous dinosaur who lives in forests not in people's houses. Is that where a brontosaurus would live? In a forest? I'm afraid that I'm not absolutely sure, but since I'm the person writing this story, I'm putting this brontosaurus in a forest. 
along with a lot of other wild beasts that I'm absolutely sure did not live on Earth when dinosaurs were there. Anyway, Lulu's mom and her dad continued explaining to her, although a brontosaurus is into eating plants, not animals, including human animals like Lulu, and although it is cute in a long-necked, pin-headed sort of way, it is much too huge and too wild to be a good pet. A dog, a cat, a goldfish, a bird, a gerbil, a guinea pig, yes. A brontosaurus? Definitely no. Chapter 3. No? Her mom and her dad were telling Lulu no. Lulu wasn't used to hearing no, and she hated, she really hated hearing no. To show how much she hated it, she screeched and screeched and screeched till all the light bulbs in the living room burst. I want a brontosaurus for my birthday present, she said in between screeches. I want a brontosaurus for a pet. Well, maybe we could get you a nice pet rabbit, said her mom, or even, said her dad, a nice pet rat. No, 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 screeched Lulu. I want a brontosaurus for a pet. And then she threw herself down on the floor and kicked her heels and waved her arms and screeched some more. Chapter four. Four days, eight days, 10 days, 12 days passed. Lulu kept saying, I want a brontosaurus. Her mom and her dad just kept on saying no. Lulu kept screeching and throwing herself on the floor and kicking her heels and waving her arms. Lulu's mom and her dad kept saying no until finally on the 13th day, the day before Lulu's birthday, right after lunch, Lulu said to her mom and her dad, okay, then foo on you. She had terrible manners. If you aren't going to get me a brontosaurus, I'm going to go out and get one for myself. Lulu packed a small suitcase, said goodbye to her mom and dad and walked out the door. And they let her go. Partly because they thought she'd change her mind and come running back home in about two minutes. And partly because it was nice to not have her screeching and kicking and waving and being a pain. Let's have a cup of tea and a couple of cookies, Lulu's mom said to her dad. Excellent idea, her dad replied. So they went into the kitchen and started munching on some cookies and sipping tea. And pretty soon, they'd forgotten all about Lulu. Chapter 5. But Lulu hadn't forgotten that she was going to get herself a brontosaurus. And luckily for Lulu, there was a great big forest not too far from her house. The animals in that forest had never bothered anybody because nobody had ever bothered them. But watch out, creatures! Here came Lulu, trudging through the forest, swinging her small suitcase back and forth and in a quite loud voice that was sure to wake the napping animals from their naps, singing this song. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a brana 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 source for a pet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a brana 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 source for a pet. The forest that Lulu was trudging through was overgrown with trees whose branches scratched her face and whose roots she tripped over. But Lulu hardly noticed because she was thinking just one thought and you know what that was. So on she went, swinging her suitcase and singing her song too loud and annoying all the creatures in the forest and being the same big pain out there that she was back in her home until... Da -da -da. Slithering down from the branch of a tree came a long, fat, brown, black snake who had been peacefully snoozing until Lulu woke him up. Sleepy and grumpy and hissing an exceedingly nasty hiss, he wrapped himself around Lulu around and around and tighter and tighter and told her she'd be really sorry that she had awakened him. I'm going to squeeze you dead, he said. Okay, so snakes don't talk, but in my story they do. And Lulu said, not if I squeeze you deader. So Lulu squeezed the snake hard and the snake yelled, ow, and quickly unwrapped himself from Lulu. And Lulu, wiping some snake sweat from the palms of her snake squeezing hands, went on trudging deeper into the forest. Chapter six. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a brana 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 source for a pet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a brana 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 source for a pet. Singing her brontosaurus song in a louder and louder voice, Lulu was white waking up nappers all over the forest. Some were annoyed, some were extremely annoyed, and among the extremely annoyed was a slinky, slinky lady tiger who yawned and stretched and rubbed her bright green eyes and then with a ferocious roar sprung out from behind some trees and pounced on Lulu. You're a big pain, the tiger said, so I'm going to eat you up for my afternoon snack. Uh-uh, said Lulu. I'm bonking you on the head. And swinging, swinging with all her might, Lulu bonked the tiger with her suitcase. The tiger yelled, ow, and fell down in a pitiful black and orange striped heap on the forest floor. Lulu brushed off a few tiger hairs that were stuck to the side of her tiger bonking suitcase and went on trudging deeper into the forest. 
Chapter 7 As the afternoon turned into late afternoon and then into early evening, Lulu trudged ever deeper into the forest. When she felt hungry, she opened her suitcase and took out a pickle sandwich. When she felt cold, she took out a sweater and socks. And when it got buggy, she opened her suitcase and took out some bug spray and sprayed. She was feeling a little tired, but she kept trudging and swinging her suitcase and singing her song. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a brown, a brown, a brown, a brown, a source for a pet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a brown, a brown, a brown, a brown, a source for a pet. Now a big black bear who liked listening to the music that insects make in the early evening couldn't hear their song because Lulu's was louder. Plus a lot of the insects were deader because Lulu kept on spraying them with her spray. And this made it mad and then madder and then madder than that. He growled a thunderous growl. And then he lumbered heavily down the forest path and stood on his two hind legs in front of Lulu. Waving a big clawy paw in her face, he said, you're interrupting my favorite program. Please don't give me an argument in my story. Bears are allowed to have favorite programs. So I'm going to scratch you to pieces with my claws. Lulu glared at the big black bear and put her hands on her hips. Nobody's scratching me, she told the bear. And then she jumped as high as she possibly could in the air. And then she landed as hard as she possibly could on his foot. The bear yelled, ow, and went limping away as fast as a bear could limp with one stomped foot. And after shaking some broken bear toenails off the bottoms of her bear stomping shoes, Lulu went trudging deeper into the forest. Chapter 8. Lulu was now in the deepest, darkest, quietest part of the forest. It was getting quite late and she was getting quite tired. And she took her sleeping bag out of her suitcase, spread it on the ground, and lay down to sleep. But before she slept, she sang her song once more. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a brown, a brown, a brown, a brown, a source for a pet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a brown, a brown, a brown, a brown, a source for a pet. Actually, she never even got to sing the last line because before she could get to it, she was sleeping. Chapter 8 and 1 half. At dawn, Lulu woke to the sound of birds calling to one another and the dusky, musky smell of the forest floor and the feel of a gentle late summer breeze blowing across her face and the taste, because she hadn't bothered to brush her teeth before bedtime, of yesterday's pickle sandwich. She also woke to the sight of something so huge, so enormous, so utterly gigantic that she thought, no, she was sure that she was still dreaming. It looked like a mountain, except this mountain had legs, a very long neck, and a very small head. It was, as I'm sure you've already figured out, the brontosaurus that Lulu had been searching for. Chapter 9. Lulu closed and opened and closed and opened her eyes again and decided she wasn't dreaming after all. She quickly climbed out of her sleeping bag and announced to the brontosaurus, It's my birthday today and just in time I've found you! No, I've found you, the brontosaurus told Lulu, and I'd like to wish you a very happy birthday. Oh, it will be very happy, Lulu said to the brontosaurus, because you, she patted his ankle, because his ankle was as high as she could reach, you are the pet I'm getting for my birthday. The brontosaurus bent down his neck till his face was close to Lulu's. He looked at her back to front and head to toes, sniffing at her carefully with his brontosaurus nose and making a rumbling noise. Nobody knows how dinosaurs sound, but in my story, they rumble. And slowly nodding, nodding his pin-headed head. A pet, he said to Lulu, after he nodded for a while, is a very good thing. A very, very good thing, Lulu replied. She opened up her suitcase and went digging around inside and pulled out a white leather collar, which she fastened around the brontosaurus's neck. Now I'll just attach this leash. So he dug some more and found a long, long leash in her suitcase and take you home with me. Lulu attached the leash to the collar, feeling so pleased with herself that she sang a whole new brontosaurus song. I got it, I got it, I got what I wanted to get. A bron, a bron, a bron, a brontosaurus for a pet. I got it, I got it, I got what I wanted to get. A brown, a brown, a brown, a brown, a source for a pet. She would have kept feeling pleased with herself, except now the brontosaurus was shaking his head. He was saying in a rumbling voice, no. He was saying no and shaking his head till the collar and leash flew off. No, he said, I don't wish to be your pet. Lulu, remember, hated hearing no. So she screeched till all the birds fled from the trees and then she threw herself down on the forest floor and then she kicked her heels and waved her arms. The brontosaurus waited patiently without saying one more word until she had stopped with the screeching and kicking and waving. 
finished now? He politely asked. Maybe I am, Lulu said. Maybe I'm not. It all depends. And here she shook a finger right in the brontosaurus's face. This girl was a pain, but she wasn't a scaredy cat. It all depends on whether you stop saying no and start saying yes to being my pet. And the brontosaurus shook his head some more. Lulu thought about screeching and so forth some more, but instead she said in a very snippy voice, Now listen here. You were the one who said to me just a minute ago that, and I quote, a pet is a very good thing. That's what I said, the brontosaurus admitted. So what, Lulu asked, is your problem, Mr. B? No problem, he answered, just a misunderstanding. Because when I said that a pet is a very good thing, I didn't mean I wanted to be your pet. I meant that you'd be a very good pet for me. Chapter 10. Lulu's eyes were two round O's of amazement. She tried to speak, but at first no words came out, and then finally she was able to say in a squeaky, amazed kind of voice, I don't think I heard what I think I just heard, Mr. B. You did indeed, the brontosaurus replied. Well, if I did, Lulu's voice was back to being its old bossy self again. Well, if I did, I've got some news for you. A person has a pet. An animal is a pet. A person can't be an animal's pet ever. And I have some news for you, the brontosaurus said to Lulu, except that he spoke more politely than Lulu had done. You're about to be the first person ever to be an animal's pet. Congratulations and once again, happy birthday. He reached out a hand or whatever you want to call it and gently scooped Lulu off the forest floor. He then plumped her gently down where his back met his neck. Hold on tight, little pet, he said to Lulu. I'll pull off some leaves from the tops of the trees for your breakfast and then I'm taking you home to live with me. No, yelled Lulu. No, 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 a billion zillion times no. Yes, 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 the brontosaurus replied. I'll feed you and pat you and play with you and treat you very nicely. And all I'll expect from you is to sit and roll over and fetch a ball and do cute tricks. What do you think she was, some kind of dog girl? I really don't know. I can't read a dinosaur's mind. Lulu thought about screeching and throwing herself on the forest floor, except that the forest floor was a long way down. She thought about squeezing the dinosaur dead, except that she needed both hands to hang onto his neck. She thought about swinging and swinging her suitcase and bonking him on the head, except that she left her suitcase under a tree and she couldn't stomp on his foot because his feet were too far from his back where he plunked her. And then Lulu started to think that the only thing farther from where the brontosaurus had plunked her was her home. Her home where her mom and her dad were waiting. Her very own home where no one, not even when she was being a pain, which was most of the time, had ever, ever expected her to sit and roll over and fetch and do cute tricks. I want to go home to my house, Lulu told the brontosaurus, then added in a lot less bossier voice, please let me go back to my house, Mr. B. This was maybe the very first time in Lulu's entire life that she, without being told, had used the P word. And yet the brontosaurus shook his head no. Once you get used to it, he kindly told Lulu, I truly believe that you'll like being a pet. Lulu imagined being a pet in the house of this brontosaurus and never seeing her mom or her dad again. She imagined eating leaves and doing cute tricks. And she said to herself that if only she could turn today into yesterday, she wouldn't go looking for dinosaurs in the forest and she wouldn't say foo on you to her mom and dad. She was feeling especially sorry that she had ever said foo on you to her mom and dad. Chapter 11. The brontosaurus pulled leaves off the trees and was offering them to Lulu. She grabbed them and threw them angrily away. A simple no thank you will do, the brontosaurus said to Lulu, and I really liked that please you used before. So please, please, please let me please go home, yelled Lulu. Your yelling is hurting my ears, said the dinosaur, but I have to admit that even if you asked me softly and sweetly, I would still want to keep you here with me. I've been lonely and a pet is a very good thing. For hours and hours and hours, from early morning till just past noon, Lulu kept telling the brontosaurus he had to let her go home, and the brontosaurus kept telling Lulu no. He also kept assuring her that he'd do his absolute best to make her happy. He spoke in such a kind and nice and polite and patient voice that after a while Lulu was talking, not yelling, and after a while she was talking softly and sweetly, and pretty soon after that she started to cry. Yes, Lulu started to cry, and it wasn't very often that Lulu cried. She'd rather screech till all the light bulbs burst and all of that other stuff, but right now she just didn't feel screechy. She felt teary, and so she cried and cried and cried, soaking the brontosaurus with her tears. 
He patiently waited as Lulu continued soaking him and the forest floor with her tears. He patiently waited some more and then he said, I'm sorry I'm making you cry, little pet, but I won't be changing my mind. Would you like a tissue? Lulu now understood that no matter how hard she cried and how nice this dinosaur was, he was determined to keep her as his pet. And she now understood that if she was determined to not be his pet, she would have to escape. She cried just a little bit longer, but while she was crying on the outside, she was on the inside making a getaway plan. Sniffing a watery sniff, Lulu said to the brontosaurus, Thank you, Mr. B. I do need some tissues. If you'll just let me down on the forest floor for a minute, I'm sure I can find a box of them in my suitcase. The brontosaurus lowered his head and his neck to the floor of the forest. Lulu slid off, stood up, and smiled a small smile. She walked to her suitcase, opened it, and poked around for a while and found, are you surprised, a big box of tissues. But instead of taking the tissues out, she put her sleeping bag in, snapped her suitcase shut, and started running. The brontosaurus stood stiff and still as if he'd been glued to the ground, and then he started running after Lulu. But Lulu had darted off the path into the heart of the forest, into a part of the forest where the trees grew so close together that a creature as huge as this dinosaur could not fit. She zigged and she zagged and she zigged and she zagged through those close together trees, while the brontosaurus looked for spaces to squeeze through. He was trying his hardest to catch her, as hard as any mountain-sized creature can try, but she was leaving him farther and farther behind. Come back, little pet, come back. Lulu could hear him calling first loudly, then softer and softer. Come back, little pet, I know you'll be happy with me. Come back, little pet. His voice grew ever softer, and soon she could not hear his voice anymore. Since Lulu could not hear his voice anymore, she stopped running and started walking. She tromped through the forest in silence, heading for home. But she wasn't swinging her suitcase and she wasn't singing her song and although she very much wanted to see her mom and dad again and very much wanted not to be a pet, she felt kind of bad about the brontosaurus. And so do I, because even though I'm the person writing this story, I don't like leaving him all alone sadly calling, come back little pet, come back. Chapter 12. But then after maybe an hour, Lulu suddenly heard a different voice, a not so friendly voice saying, hold it right there. And standing up on his two hind legs and blocking her path through the forest stood the black bear she had stomped on yesterday. You hold it right there, said Lulu. And please, there was that P word again, don't keep your shaking your claw paws at me. If I have to stomp you, I'll stomp you, but I'd really rather not stomp you. I'd rather, she opened her suitcase and took out a jar of golden honey, give you this if you'll please get out of my way. What's going on with Lulu? She'd rather not stomp him? The bear took the jar of honey, opened the top, dipped in his paw, and slurpily licked it, mumbling something that sort of sounded like thank you. Dipping and licking and slurping, he hurried out of Lulu's path, and she continued tromping through the forest. Until another familiar, another not-too-friendly voice said, This time I'm eating you before you bonk me. And there was the tiger, the silky slinky tiger of yesterday, ready to pounce on her. Forget the eating and bonking, said Lulu, and try on this beautiful scarf. She pulled a long, floaty, bright green scarf from her suitcase. It matches your eyes, and I'll give it to you if you'll please get out of my way. And the tiger, happily wrapping the eye-matching scarf around her black and orange striped neck, growled something that sounded like thank you and slunk away, and Lulu continued tromping through the forest. Until, well, you know what you think. You know what you think she met next? A wolf, a giraffe, a lion? Don't be ridiculous. She met, of course, she met what else? The snake, who was hissing an even nastier hiss than he'd hissed the day before and warning her this time I'll be the tighter squeezer. Lulu, looking disgusted, told him, nobody's squeezing anybody. All I'm doing is getting home today. And then she reached in her suitcase and pulled out a small flowered rug and explained to the snake, this is for you, if you'll please get out of my way, a soft rug to rest on whenever you feel like resting. And the snake took the rug in his mouth and tried, at least I think he tried, to say thank you to Lulu, though it's hard to tell when a mouth is full of rug. And in any case, he went slithering off wherever a snake goes slithering, and Lulu continued tromping through the forest. Chapter 13. It wasn't too much later that Lulu could see that she was nearly out of the forest. She was happy that soon she would be with her mom and her dad. But along with feeling happy, she was also feeling sad when she thought of the brontosaurus she'd left behind. As a matter of fact, she pictured the poor lonely dinosaur so clearly in her mind that it almost seemed he was standing there just outside of the forest waiting for her. And he was!
Was Lulu shocked? You bet. What, 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 she asked. Are you doing here, Mr. B? I found a shortcut, the brontosaurus replied. Lulu smiled a soft, sweet smile and then shook her head and sighed. And then she said, and even though I'm the person writing the story, I truly don't know why she's saying it in rhyme. Please try to understand, Mr. B, that I cannot be your pet, even though you're the nicest brontosaurus that I ever met. And if you take me away with you, I'll keep on running back home every chance that I get. Not a bad rhyme, though. The last line's a little lumpy. I already figured out that while I was waiting for you, the brontosaurus told Lulu, I do understand that you can't be my pet, but please understand that I can't be your pet either. Well, Lulu understood and the brontosaurus understood. It seemed there was only one thing left to do, so they stood there quietly looking at each other for a moment, and then they did it. The brontosaurus bent his long neck till his face was close to Lulu's. He kissed her gently on the cheek and said, happy birthday, little pet, and goodbye. And Lulu put her arms around the brontosaurus's neck and she kissed him gently on his nose and said, don't be too lonely, Mr. B, and goodbye. Then she slowly walked down the road that would take her home. And then he slowly walked down the road that would take him home. And although Lulu and the brontosaurus remembered each other forever, they never saw each other again. The maybe end. Chapter 13, again. Wait, I'm not really all that sure about this ending. It may be a little too mushy, a little too sad, but since I'm the person writing this story, I'm writing another ending, and you can decide which one you'd rather have. Well, Lulu understood and the brontosaurus understood that neither of them could be the other's pet, but why should that mean they had to say goodbye? Come with me and I'll give you a piece of my birthday cake, said Lulu. I'd like that, the dinosaur said. May I give you a ride? And Lulu arrived at her house, riding happily on the back of the brontosaurus. When her mom and her dad heard the noise of the dinosaur clomping into their yard, they remembered Lulu and they remembered her birthday. Lucky for all, her cake had already been made. Don't worry, he isn't my pet, Lulu said. He's only going to stay here for a piece of cake and a glass of lemonade, but he's kind of a lonely guy, and I would like to invite him back for Thanksgiving dinner. From that time on, the brontosaurus came to Lulu's house for her birthday, Thanksgiving, and the 4th of July. And sometimes she visited his house, though, since she didn't like eating leaves, she always brought a suitcase of pickle sandwiches. On one very special birthday, she not only invited her friend the brontosaurus, but also the snake and the tiger and the bear. And the brontosaurus noticed that whenever Lulu asked anyone for anything, she always said, please. The end. Maybe. Chapter 13, yet again. Hmm. I'm still not totally satisfied. I'm going to try once more because I think I need to answer certain questions like, were Lulu's mom and dad worried sick when she hadn't come home that night? Had they brought her a present for her birthday? Did she completely stop being a pain and turn into a polite? And how did all that stuff fit into her suitcase? I'm going to answer these questions. And when I'm done, you will have your choice of three different endings. Well, Lulu understood and the brontosaurus understood that although they couldn't be each other's pets, they could be friends. So Lulu invited the brontosaurus back to her house for some birthday cake and introduced him to her mom and dad. They hadn't been waiting and worrying and wondering where she was because they had fallen asleep, sipping their tea. They didn't open their eyes until the brontosaurus with Lulu riding on his back came clomp, clomp, clomping into their front yard. They gave her a silver necklace for her birthday. She sang them a whole new brontosaurus song. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, didn't get a bron a bron a bron a brontosaurus for a pet. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, didn't get a bron a bron a bron a brontosaurus for a pet. It sure looks like you brought one home, Lulu's mom said to Lulu. And we still say no, you can't have one, said her dad. And both of them waited for Lulu to screech and throw herself down on the floor and kick her heels and wave her arms in the air. Except she didn't. What happened to the screeching? asked her quite astonished mom. And her dad asked, what happened to throwing yourself on the floor? Lulu replied, very dignified. I'm one year older today and I'm not doing that kid stuff anymore. And she says a very nice please, said the brontosaurus. After the cake and the lemonade, the dinosaur said goodbye, but he would sometimes return for holiday visits. Sometimes the snake and the tiger and the bear came too. Although she kept getting older, Lulu never turned into perfect. She still, though less and less often, sometimes screeched and forgot about please, though she never again in her life said foo on you. But she mainly wasn't a pain, and the brontosaurus was mainly not lonely anymore. And as for how that stuff fit into her Lulu's suitcase, I'm sorry to say that I don't have a clue. I am, after all, just the person who's writing this story. The end.
So that was Lulu and the Brontosaurus by Judith Bjorst with the illustrations by Lane Smith. And we also had tonight The Last Mastodon by Christina Olson and poems by myself and Brian Simino. And of course, uh, Sound of Thunder from Ray Bradbury's Golden Apples of the Sun. So um, if you like what you heard tonight, please support your local bookstores, order online or for curbside pickup for them so they can uh, stay afloat in these difficult times. This was some of each episode for Prehistoric, and I'll see you all next week. Good night.